this video, I will try to help you make sense of the well, the concept of an unintentional radiator um, when it comes to FCC regulations and specifically Title Title Forty Seven, which is something you have to consider if you're importing or manufacturing um, electronics in the, in the United States. So you can see here on the left, what is an unintentional radiator? Let's start with the definition and move on to examples. A supplies declaration of conformity or an SDOC authorization procedure. That's a very that's a core part of this. Then we look into technical requirements, the information statement, the device label, and finally lab testing requirements. All right, let's get to it. So, what is an unintentional radiator? An unintentional radiator is a device that uses digital logic or electrical signals operating at a radio frequency internally or sending radio frequency signals to other devices uh, through wiring. Doesn't include, it doesn't include devices that are intended to emit uh, radio frequency energy wirelessly. So that would be, say, uh, it wouldn't cover a, a Wi-Fi enabled device or a Bluetooth enabled device like, like this mouth. But, well, what do you see here is a wire, right? So this microphone, I imagine, could indeed be an unintentional radiator. Just to help you distinguish between the two. Here are some examples, and this comes straight from the FCC.gov uh, website. It's one of the guidance documents that they provide. One of the better ones, anyway. Examples that they provide is coffee pots, wristwatches, personal computers, printers, garage doors, receivers, RF universal remote control. Some of these are wireless, but I assume the examples, in this case, they are referring to those that are not, say, while well, using uh, radio frequency. Anyway, you can find uh, the exact same list if you follow this URL. I also believe it can be questioned. Um, a lot of kitchen appliances these days do have some sort of, say, Bluetooth or other uh, wireless communication modules these days uh, in which case you wouldn't necessarily say that well you wouldn't be able to claim that a coffee pot uh, or, or an espresso machine that you can control using your phone uh, through say bluetooth or you know the wi-fi network or whatever would then be an unintentional uh, radiator in that case it, it should be an intentional radiator which we got another video on that so don't see this list as, as, as definitive, especially as we go into a world with of IoT, Internet of Things and all that. Um, it, it might be a bit misleading. So don't see this as a definitive list. It's better to look at the definition and understand it from a more technical perspective. In any case, what you need to do is to, well, the big difference between intentional and unintentional radiators is that if you got an unintentional radiator, then you follow sort of a self-certification procedure, which is also called the SDOC authorization procedure. And that's essentially what this video is about. That's what you need to understand. So what this means is that for starters, the unintentional radiator, say this microphone, it has to uh, comply with the applicable FCC rules. And I'll get to that in a bit, or the technical requirements. At the very core of product compliance, we generally have technical, uh, technical requirements, right? Second, you need to maintain the required documentation that demonstrate compliance with the FCC rules. Maintain a presence in the US. I don't know what that means. You have to check the website, the FCC website, to explain that. Prepare a compliance information statement. I'll get to that in a bit. And then there are some exceptions. Scanning receivers, radar detectors. It sounds like military equipment to me. Uh, any case, that's not what this video is about. But I just want to mention that there are some exceptions. So in short, unintentional radiator, you follow the SDOC procedure, unless it's a scanning receiver, radar detector, or yeah, something like that. But I guess that's not the business you're in. Okay, let's look into in the, the technical requirements. And well, yeah, for starters, they uh, so often can be quite vague. You have to comply with the general technical requirements. Okay, that's good to know. Um, further information can be found on the FCC, um, FCC website. There are also measurement standards, and essentially what this comes down to is to ensure that, okay, your device, such as this microphone, it doesn't, it doesn't communicate, so it doesn't have any like Wi-Fi transmitter, receiver, Bluetooth, so it doesn't sound, send waves into the air that could potentially uh, interfere with, with other radio frequencies, and that's the whole point of the FCC and what they do, that's the core of their mission anyway. But 
even then you have an electromagnetic uh, you have electromagnetic interference and essentially what this comes down to is is measuring that because despite the fact that it's not wirelessly enabled some devices can still interfere uh, electronically with other equipment and that's essentially what this procedure is about to ensure that it doesn't do that what's the likelihood of a microphone doing that i don't know i would guess fairly low then there are also radiated emission limits okay so that sets limits whereas here you got the uh, the measurement standard but in short this microphone assuming it's an unintentional radiator which i don't know but i guess it is depending on the definition uh, it's not supposed to interfere with equipment like this computer, this phone, this air conditioning unit, and so on. Okay, and that's what the technical requirements are are primarily about. It could be something else too, but just to give you an idea, so this becomes a little little uh, easy to relate to. There are also different device classes, which I'm not going to go into detail. You got class A and class B, and I think that concerns whether it's used in a home environment or a uh, commercial environment which could be government buildings could be could be commercial offices could be hotels I'm just guessing now I'm sure you can find a more detailed definition but that's another dimension to it but in order to not make this video 90 minutes long I'm not gonna go into detail about that I'm explaining the general procedure and you also need to verify compliance through testing okay so core part of the SDOC procedure is to create the SDOC compliance information statement. You need a unique identifier, trademark, sorry, a trade name or model number, of course, to identify the product. Responsible party, that's US contact information, US presence, um, uh, presence remember, company name, street address, city and state, zip code, telephone number, or internet contact information. I, guess that could be a website or an email I don't know this also comes from the FCC guidance documents I'm not making this up finally you need a FCC compliance statement and this is also something you can find on the FCC website in a guidance document um, I think they give you three different options if I remember correctly you can find those on the ECFR um, depending on the type of, of, of product so they got different types but there is a standard uh, compliance statement that is mostly used for consumer electronics at least that's my understanding but you find it, all of this stuff on, on the FCC website but yeah you need to issue a, a well let me just go back here you need to issue a information statement and this could be printed it could be in the user instructions could be part of the packaging then we also have the device label and well you may have seen this logo before this is the fcc compliance mark or compliance logo i think they call it the device label must have it must carry the product identification the trade name and type or model so that you can identify the product and of course connect this to any technical documentation like test reports and so on and and of course the compliance statement fcc logo i think they made it optional and the compliance statement this is referring to the compliance statement I just mentioned um, on, on the previous one. In fact, FCC is quite vague in the guidance document as to whether you need the compliance statement on the label. But when we did this research with our team here, we couldn't find it mentioned a compliance statement, but it was still quite vague. So I, I choose to include it here. But if any expert here come and say that this is all bogus, then I stand corrected. But that's what we understood anyway. Okay, then lab testing. So lab testing, as, as, you, as you likely know, lab testing is essentially a process of verifying compliance technically, okay? And, and at the very core, technical compliance in this case relates to uh, ensuring that the device is not interfering with other devices. So, yeah, I, I mentioned the, uh, the limitations and I also mentioned the measurement standard. Some companies offering uh, testing services corresponding to FCC uh, requirements includes Kima, Intertech, TV Rhineland, and also SGS. Just, I'm sure there's a hundred others out there, but yeah, these are some of the, the the bigger names that you've likely heard of. Okay, and that's everything I had to say. I know this was a very brief introduction. There's a lot more to say about FCC unintentional radiators. I could go on for another hour, but see this as a brief introduction. Hopefully, I helped you make some sense out of this and again i recommend that now that perhaps you have a 
a broad overview of the uh, requirements for unintentional radiators, you can go to the FCC website and, and go and look further into the details. If you have questions, you can write your questions uh, either on our website or also um, you can do the same if you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you for watching.